Hello to everybody. Thank you for joining us for another Helbling English webinar. Just a few ground rules before we get started. As you know, your cameras and your microphones are switched off, but please do use the chat box to interact and select everyone in the drop down so we can all see your messages. And don't forget that tomorrow you will receive an email with a link to get your certificate of attendance. So today we're absolutely delighted to be joined by Nora Nagy, who is the um, co-editor of our Helbling English Readers blog. Many of you may have already seen a number of posts. If you haven't, at the end of today's talk, we'll tell you how you can sign up. So without further ado, Nora, if you'd like to turn on your camera and your video, it'd be lovely to see you. Hi. Hello. I'm going to let you introduce the topic of your talk today, which I'm very excited to um, hear you speak about. So thanks very much for joining us and good luck and have a fantastic talk. Thanks very much. Thank you, Lucy. Hello, everyone. I've been just reading the chat box and I'm so happy to see so many people from all over the world, literally. Um, and and it's, I think it's going to be a fun event. And I, I wish I could really see you in real life right now. So the topic of the webinar, as you might know already, is multimodal reading. And we will talk a little bit about, and let me just get into the plan already. Uh, we will talk a little bit about how, what multimodal reading is and what the basic ideas of the multimodal approach are to, I'm sorry. Something happened to my slideshow, which I have to pause. Okay, I'm going back. So we will talk, talk about the basic idea of the multimodal approach to communication and learning. And I will show you some examples of multimodal texts. We will compare multimodal reading and a normal uh, type of reading that you might be all very familiar with already. Um, we will talk a little bit about skills integration, how you can integrate reading, viewing, and listening mainly, but we will have some other skills uh, as well to talk about. And finally, I, I tell you what I think are the benefits for your students. So let's get started. Uh, if we talk about multimodality, we really need to talk about monomodality first. And what's important here is that I Something is happening to my slideshow. I'm really sorry about it. Let me just let me just uh, stop it for a moment. Okay, and I pause again. It should be working now. So we we need to talk about monomodality first. When you look at these images, you see a book and you see a concert. You see a famous painting, the radio, and an academic article. In all of these examples, some kind of resource, some kind of meaning-making device is emphasized. In the book is the written text. In the concert is the music, although there are also the people, but they are all wearing black because they want to emphasize the music. In the image, there are the colors and there's the image itself, the face of the girl. In the radio, and as the trickiest, you only have the sound and nothing else. When it comes to an academic journal, of course, you have the layout and different fonts, but they are really downplayed because they want to focus on the written text. This is a kind of monomodal thinking. Of course, there are a lot of modalities and a lot of resources happening at the same time, but one thing is emphasized. But if you turn to an opera, if you look at a fun cartoon from the New Yorker, if you look at a blog website, for example, if you look at a blog, then you have or a picture book or an illustration, like a fun illustration, like the one from Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, you will see that a lot of things are in combination. So you have the, da the dance, the movement, the body language, you have the image and the text working together, you have hyperlinks and, and icons, and you have in the, in the website, and you have images and colors and fonts and all sorts of other things that will happening in the picture book. So we are going towards and we are starting to think about a multimodal approach in which a lot of different resources are working together to create some sort of meaning. This is the main idea here. So to sum it up for you, uh, in classic fiction as well, 
and this is the simplest way of looking at it to just give you more examples, we have images and text working together. We might think that this is something new, but it is really not very new. Because if you think about uh, classic fiction, like Great Expectations, or you think about Sherlock Holmes, they were published in series in magazines, for example, or they were always published with illustrations. So today's graded readers, with all these beautiful illustrations, are not really new, but they function a bit differently. Because if you look at the right-hand side image, you will see that you have the image and the text, but you have extra icons and images and layout functions, which will, we will see, reveal even more meaning than just a simple illustration. If you look at and you compare a graded reader edition of the same uh, uh, story, here we are talking still about great expectations by Charles Dickens, or you look at an e-text edition, they are basically the same because you have image and text working together, but what's different is the length of the lines, the presence of the audio recording or not. There are no glossaries, uh, glossed words in the e-text, and you have to read really long lines, which is actually important for a student because if they read shorter lines, it might be easier to them to remember what they have been reading. Now let's look at some basic ideas about what the modes are behind this multimodal approach. When we talk about multimodality, we say that there are different resources for making meaning, for example, language, images, and music. All these resources are socially shaped and culturally given, so it's always important to think about the cultural context and the social context of each and every text, because the same thing might mean different things in different cultural contexts. <clears throat> we are language teachers, so we focus on written and uh, spoken language. But we need to remember that language is always embedded in meaning making in combination with non-linguistic resources. So, and today, especially with all the digital resources we have and all the course books we have, we, we, we have to switch the way we think about language and we need to see how language acts in combination with everything else. Um, another important thing is that when you look at a course book, when you look at a picture book, when you look at a poster or a video, you will have different modes working together, audio, images, hyperlinks, icons, and the text itself. Each resource we perform different kinds of communicating functions, but they are also integrated. So that's where the fun starts to begin. Let's go move on. So all these resources make up these multimodal texts, which can be paper-based or digital, live or complex. You work with these texts every day, picture books, course books, comics, graphic novels, and posters. When you think about digital texts, we, we think of uh, slideshow presentations, online photo galleries, animation, film, digital stories, web pages, podcasts. When it's live, it can be the opera, the theater, dance show, or a storytelling, or a concert, or even a webinar like this one. And the really complex one is like a museum exhibition, where even space matters, where the three-dimensional experience of the whole thing matters, because you become part of a big text around your, you. So you are working with most of these texts every day, I think. This is why it's important for a language teacher to I think forget the four skills model. We have, I think we have been, we have long been talking about more skills than just four skills, uh, because an extended model of the essential skills will include viewing and multimodal composing as well, as it has been very nicely pointed out by researchers in the area. So viewing will mean that you help your students work with images, and multimodal composing means that when we ask a student to prepare a presentation or a poster or a, an illustrated diary or some other thing or a video, we need to have them know, we, have, we need to have them understand all the different resources that they can use and how they can combine them. So let's move on to see what's going on with text inside the text. 
when you think of Helding readers, I'm going to use Helding readers examples or through the webinar. So when we think of Helding readers as multimodal text, we can think about print-based components and the digital components. In the print-based components, you have written language, images, both in the form of illustrations and symbols. We have typography, layout, and color. These are important that I stress them because they are emphasized and they have important functions in the print uh, readers. In the digital components, we have spoken language in audio recordings. We have sounds in the audio recording. We have the in interactive web pages uh, and online games, especially in the Thinking Train series for young learners, it's, 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 it's really nice. So when we look at actual examples, so multimodal components in the print page. This example comes from the listening series reader Midnight Bay. You will have an image that's important. You also have an image and a symbol with a digital extension, which is a spoken language. That's something, there's a little icon the students should guess, but they won't really guess. That's my experience because they might not pay attention to detail. So you need to tell them that the icon is a mobile phone, which means that you can listen to the story on your mobile phone if you download the Helping Media app, but you can just listen to it on, the, on, the, on your phone. You have the written language, but you can also see these little red dots, which are again meaningful because they sign the closed words, which you can check at the bottom of the page. So layout, typographic color is in combination with the images and the audio recording. They all come together in the print page, uh, printed page. Then if you talk about the listening series, and there's a really interesting uh, feature of this series, which is you have a page with typical exercises and images. And here, what you really focus on, what you are emphasizing is the audio recording and your listening but you are supporting it with some images and some activities within the page. The idea is the same here as before. Now, you can give even more scaffolding. And if you are doing any kind of listening, you can always print the, uh, the transcript. This way, you focus on something very different because you are helping your students focus on the actual text, not just the general understanding of the audio, but the written language can really support the audio. I think we can all agree that pure listening is widespread and it's really used by students, but they they find it really hard to listen to the radio or just to listen to a speech, any kind of, without subtitles. I think we are very much used to subtitles these days. And while it's a really good thing that students read and listen at the same time, I think it's also important to help them with focusing only on listening sometimes. Okay. Let's check quickly what the multimodal components of the digital page are. You have the written language, you have images and symbols, you have, um, you have text again in the, um, in the exercises, but what's different is that you have interactive elements, uh, which actually help you because they give immediate feedback to your students. So it's more like a real life um, learning experience with a really fast teacher. So you, you can manipulate this. They can easily learn it. They already know it, but they might need some practice. Okay, the audio is interesting because I, I mentioned it, that you can download the Hubbling Media app and focus only on the audio. Which, what is really nice is that once you have, for example, Midnight Bait, you can check all the chapters. You can see that on the left-hand side uh, image. You have the chapter or the page choice. If you listen to the chapter, the app will help you focus only on the text, uh, listening itself by, and show it will show you this really nice cover image. If you go into the exercise function, it gives you a student who focuses on the page as if he or she is really paying attention to something and learning something. So what we emphasize here is the audio component so students can really practice spoken language. Okay, let's look at a uh, thinking train uh, example. This is from the girl and the magpie, a lovely thinking train uh, story. In this series, you get double page illustrations. It's very similar to the typical traditional picture book students are already familiar with, where you have a beautiful full page uh, illustrations. 
short text, but you also have the audio function, which you can listen to on eZone Kit. The images are really powerful. That's where you get most of the meaning out of. But you also have the text and you have something extra that you might not find in normal picture books. That's the little, little uh, text uh, in the orange box, which says speak. It will help you and your student focus on some kind of linguistic or visual or grammatical or vocabulary uh, idea. So or some kind of um, reflection it will uh, help you with. So here the text in the box will help you with typography and layout. I mentioned eZone Kids. Uh, eZone Kids you see is more colorful than uh, eZone for teenagers and adults like the, same, the normal eZone. eZone Kids is really colorful. It has fun font, fonts and really nice images that, will, that might be more engaging and inviting for students. And it really helps them focus on a single thing so they don't get too much distraction, which is also very important in a web page. Then you look at the digital component of the online games. That's very similar to all the games the students might already be playing online. They can easily man manipulate that, but you, you might want to help them with the interactive features and buttons. Here is, for example, a really nice example. They can choose if they want to focus on pairs, what's their face family, what are you doing, spot the difference, and I have given you what are you doing exercise in which they can listen and view things at the same time and do some kind of interactive game uh, online. All of this is, of course, is always very age appropriate and will help your students get the most out of the reading experience. Now, these are the examples. These are what multimodal texts are like. These are all examples of multimodal texts. When you're designing a lesson, a reading lesson, or any kind of language lesson with such uh, resources, I think there are five main questions that you can ask yourself. First, what different multimodal resources are available to the students in the reading session? So what am I working with? Written text, illustration, visual organizers, and interactive and digital games. Because if you know all this and you are thinking about your resources this way, you can get more, more out of them. Second, what different skills need to be activated to work with different resources? Reading, viewing, listening. Is it also important to help students with composing? Is it important to think about the cultural context and talk a little bit about that too? Three, what are the characteristics of the different media available? So we are not only talking about the resources, but the media might be different. For example, you have the printed book, audio recording, a mobile app, reading activity on the, on the web page. If we move on, I have two more questions for you. What is the function of the different resources? For example, they can illustrate the story, define a word, organize content, highlight comprehension, questions, and create an atmosphere. These are all very different functions. And you might want to tell your students that this is what we are looking for here. I will talk about it later, but when you are doing this, when you are explaining to your students how the different elements of your book work, you are really helping them to think about multimodal texts and you are helping them, helping them with some kind of higher order thinking skills, which is really important for them. The fifth question should be, how can you characterize the relationship between the, between the different resources? It sounds really complex, but it's very simple because you can talk about image text relations, image audio relations and audio text relations or, or the relationship or the different resources and their relationships all together. I'll show you examples of this, of course. Now, why are you are doing this and putting all these skills and modes together and thinking about their relationships, what you are really doing you are integrating all sorts of skills that we mentioned before, not only the four skills, but six skills already. While you are doing this, you can focus on only one skill. You can have a bimodal focus and think only about image and text and give it the students an exercise in which they compare what they read and what they see. Or you can have a really complex focus, but you are also focusing on digital skills because digital is not simply 
putting whatever is in print on the screen because you have new possibilities and new functions because of interactivity hyperlinks and a very different reading path. Uh, by reading path, we mean that, for example, in Western culture, you read from left to right. But everyone knows, and my students also immediately respond, oh, okay, but what happens to Japanese manga or any kind of other text that comes from a different culture that you read from right to left? So that's a really set kind of reading path for you in printed materials. But when you go digital and you go and read on the screen, the reading path is not that simple and not decided for you. It is manipulated, of course, and, and your gaze is um, somehow led by different uh, resources on the web page. If something is flashing, you will obviously look at the flashing image, but still you can start looking wherever you want to start looking. But it's also important that for skills in integration, you can choose the right media format uh, for skills focus. You can decide if you want print or audio on mobile and so on. So you can think about all these things together. This is what I was talking about just now, is that when you have different types of, you have different types of reading. When we read print-based texts, written texts or multimodal texts, we work with different resources. So in the written text, words tell what you are reading. It's more visual. You are also touching the page, of course, and the paper is important, but it's mostly visual and, of course, text-based. There's dialogue, but first, second, and third person narration and so on. The style is, is verbal. There's wordplay. And in a visual sense, it's typographical, formatting matters, layout matters, and punctuation matters, and so on. When it comes to imagery, it's about, uh, it's verbal. Description, symbolism, metaphor, and so on. And the reading path, something I introduced a second ago, is mostly linear and sequential, and the reader mostly follows it. Of course, I know a lot of people who start reading a magazine at the back, which is normal, I think, for magazine readers. But when you are reading fiction, you probably want to start it at the beginning and finish on the last page. Now, when it comes to multimodal text, you have more images, maybe. So layout, size, shape, color, line, angle, position, perspective, all these things are important. It's tactile, but you have also hearing, it's moving. So a lot of different senses are involved. Um, Interpersonal meanings, like the relationship between me and the text, uh, are developed through visual features, how you are positioned, from what angle something is represented, what perspective you you have in the in the image. You have graphics, animation, and frames, menu boards, hypertext things. So you have a lot of additional features in the in the organization of a multimodal text. And most importantly, the reading path is non-sequential and non-linear. You have more choice and opportunity to interact. And there are a lot of vectors. And by vectors, we mean actual arrows pointing at different things or some kind of gaze of a person or somebody's pointing at someone, imitating an arrow. So sometimes you follow all these vectors, but in a non-sequential and non-linear way, maybe. So you can see that when you think about how you work with these texts, it's, it's a bit different from like the traditional print-based kind of reading. Okay, so let's for, start focusing on the different skills. First, we can focus on listening. When we think only about listening, we focus on speech and sounds, intonation matters, tone, speed, and volume. Students develop phonological and phonemic awareness. When they are listening actively and uh, they are engaged in active listening, it, it takes a lot of concentration. They get really tired because they need to focus on not only the meaning of the words, but the intention of the speaker and the emotions of the speaker are also there. So listening is a really uh, complex and really deep kind of skill, I think, that we are working with. How can you support it. So here's a tip. When you think about listening strategies, 
think about four main areas of listening strategies. In the listening series, you actually get support for all of these um, and different soft skills. So you can listen to distinguish words and expressions, which is also called discriminative listening. You can listen for details and information. That's precise listening. You can listen for general understanding, listening for gist and summarizing. That's what we do most of the time, I think, when we talk to each other. And you can listen to evaluate and analyze something. So you listen for inference. These, if you really think about it, really tap into different soft skills and, and they require different kind of attention levels and knowledge as well. Because to have general understanding, it might be enough just to have basic knowledge of the language. But when you listen for details and information, then it's really important to have an understanding of words and how they are pronounced and the differences between uh, different pronunciations. Now, viewing. We go for, first go one by one, and then we will talk about the skills in combination. Viewing is really interesting as well, because you can decide to look at the images alone or in relation to, relation to the rest of the book. These are called multimodal or intermodal relations. You should focus on what is being represented, but it's also important how it is represented. For example, you can focus on how the reader is positioned through the images. I show you a nice example of this later. Plus, when you are viewing something, it's not only the typical uh, visual description, like I can see a girl playing with her dog in the garden kind of thing, but you can also talk about the feeling the images evoke, the atmosphere of the illustrations, and which can actually influence the whole reading experience. Here's a more complex yet very structural understanding of viewing. This is the social semiotic approach to multimodal uh, literacy, actually. And this, this comes from a really interesting research. You can talk about narrative structures, meaning in the composition, interaction, or context. I will highlight some examples for you from all this and um, show you examples because I think it's easier to understand what we mean by each of them. So here's a tip for viewing. When you talk about color, on the left, you can see the first page of the first chapter in Midnight Bay. On the right, you can see another picture book, uh, listen, uh, listening uh, reader called The Angel. I think that when you look, they look at the two pages, you see that they are identical, except 40 images. And the images will immediately put some kind of idea in your mind about what the stories are like, what kind of setting they are, they are in, and, and who the main characters might be. So on the left-hand side, you see bright colors, warm colors, and some kind of happy environment. Whereas on the right-hand side, you see dark colors, um, mysterious environment, might be a very interesting character. So this can be a really nice idea for building background knowledge, activating vocabulary, and we're teaching students new ideas. This can also help you with predicting what might happen in the text, and students can actually do some guessing uh, already. What you are actually doing, you are talking about colors. What are the main colors? Are they called warm? How do they make you feel? Do they carry, carry any cultural meaning? Because might, it might be something different for one student in one country and in another. So it might be interesting to compare what colors mean for different cultures. Um, that's where you might start if you talk about color. Now, another interesting thing to talk about is size and proportions. Here, a detail becomes more visible for a particular reason. And it's not by chance because the graphic designers and the illustrators know very well what they are doing, I think. Um, they might want to engage you more. They might want to have an emotional impact on you. They might, they might want to, you to zoom in on a face or an object, or they might even give you some sort of perspective. So here, the magpie is really big. We focus on the magpie. And then, of course, the direction is also important here because both the mother on the right, left-hand side 
and the magpie are looking at the middle of the page where the two children are looking for something. So they are a bit like you, the observer, looking at the children. At the same time, you can ask your students to imagine that they are the magpie and the mother and, and, and narrate the whole story from their perspective. Or you can ask the, them to think that they are the little girl and the boy looking for something near the castle. Here, we talk about place in the composition. So if something is play, uh, placed in the middle uh, of an image, it might be more significant, you, you will say. If it's also red, then it's really, really important. Your students will immediately think and they will want to find out about it. So here you have two divers looking at an object which is right in the middle, which is a bit isolated, and it has a really important, imp some sort of importance you might want students to find out us to the students to find out about it from the text. So what is this object? Why is it there? Why do they need to be careful around it? Because I assume they are being really careful. Positioning the viewer is something I mentioned before. So here's an example from Midnight Bay. You are positioned behind a driver and a passenger, and you are looking looking at a scene, you are, you are driving along the coast with them. You can ask students like, where are you positioned? Uh, why do you think it's important that you are looking at this image with them? What can you see? What can they see? So it, it gives you some sort of perspective. You are part of the story here in a way. And finally, when we think about only viewing, contact and distance can be interesting. When, when you are when you are when you zoom out and you look at the, a scene from a distance, it gives you more information and it gives you some kind of new perspective when you can actually summarize what's been going on and you can, you might find some closure here. So the magpie is flying away, the little girl is in her room, the foxes are looking up, and all the animals are close to each other but not too close. So there's some distance and it gives you an objective kind of perspective on the whole scene. You can ask like how close are people or objects? What kind of relationships do they have? How are they feeling just based on this experience? Now, you have, we have looked at listening, reading, listening and uh, viewing. Now let's look at all these skills in integration. When you decide to focus on viewing and reading, you can ask like what the, what the relationship is between the images and text are like. So after many, many years of, of, of teaching this to my own students, and I have read a lot of taxonomies and structural descriptions between images and text, I still find that the simplest way of approaching the relationship between images and text is to think about them whether they are converging or diverging. Now, if you say this to your students, they might look at you like, what? I don't understand what you're talk talking about. This is what I mentioned, like they do not have to get this meta language that you understand. It's enough if you so students know that meanings in the image and the text can be similar or different. So if there's co-commitment of meaning, they connect. If the meanings differ, they might bring new meanings. It's already some kind of, Meta language to think about multimodal texts, but we don't have to scare them with, with really technical with technical terms like converging and diverging. But it might help you to remember that this is how we actually look at all these meanings together. Um, and when it comes to like, okay, if there is co-commitment or some kind of difference between the different resources, well, how do the modes complement each other to create new meanings is the, the question to ask. So let me show you examples because it's always easier with examples. Look at this page. Let me read it to you. So this comes from a girl, the, the girl and the magpie. And this scene, in this scene, you can see a boy and a girl cycling home. The text says, now they are cycling home. Faye's bracelet is not on her arm. Oh no, it's my favorite bracelet, she says. Faye wants to go back to the park and the castle, but it's too late. I'm sure mom can drive us back. 
we can look for your bracelet together, says Jonathan. If you read the text, you get one kind of meaning. If you look at the images, you have a lot more information. You see that the girl is sad. You see that she is even crying. You have information about the environment. There's a badger and there are some bunnies and it's a beautiful scene with, with the sun is setting and there are flowers and, and, and trees around. So you get a lot more information uh, from the image. Um, but if you put the two together, you create a really complex meaning. So questions to ask, what meanings are there in the text which are not in the image? They are actually diverging, they are very different because they, have, they are complementing each other in a way. What meanings are there in the image which are not in the text? Does the text say how Faye is feeling? It doesn't actually, it's in, it's in the image on her face. How do the colors make you feel? Okay, because the colors are really happy and, and I think they are very positive, but the feelings of the girl are really negative in a way now. Can you see the bracelet in the image? Because it's not said there, not represented there, it's only in the text. Do you know where they are going and where Faye wants to go? So if you look at the image, you have no idea that they might go back to a castle, but if you read the text, you know that. So, and there's a question box, which might help you reveal even more meanings. I said that this is a special feature of, a, of the Thinking Train series and other uh, readers, where you get some kind of support and questions to have you focus on some kind of interesting feature of the story. So this is one way of looking at viewing and reading together. Let me show you another example. Here, the illustration is not really part of the whole story, but it gives context and information about the participants and the setting. So in the previous example, they, they complement each other in a really complex way to create a new meaning. Here in, in readers for teens and adults, the illustration is more uh, about giving context or creating an atmosphere. It also, you can, as I mentioned before, you can talk about the feelings, the colors evoke, you can talk about the setting, you can guess what the characters are like based on the images, and you can use it for prediction and guessing, or you can actually ask students to say like, okay, then find a sentence or find a passage that the, the images illustrate, and it will actually help them scan and look for details within the text. You can use images for really specific reading skills development as well, if you think about it. Okay, now we want to read and listen. It's a bit like uh, watching films with subtitles without the video content, actually. Or, uh, yeah. So the reading strat strategy here is that you read the text while you are listening. It's very different from reading only or listening only, we all know. Because there's, a, there's different knowledge areas which are developed here. You can practice pronunciation this way. You can do spelling, intonation. You can focus on word groups and syntax because when students listen to someone, they might experience a different an interpretation actually of the, of the text. And you can have additional meanings when you, when you listen to the recording of a reader. For example, there, there will be sounds of the environment which are not written in the text, noises. You can guess how the characters are feeling or you might imagine what their personalities are like just based on their voices. Um, so here's a tip. Uh, you can ask students to mark interesting words as they listen. How do they sound? It might be something that the students don't know how to pronounce a word and they can mark it, or they just they might just find it interesting with the way the word sounds and it's not it doesn't sound the way they imagined it would sound. Or you can focus on what meanings are present in the recording, which are not in the text or image. And this is very specific listening, but really interesting because you can say that I didn't think that she was really sad, but her voice suge suggests that she's really sad. And even just saying something like this is reflecting on a lot of things that, that are happening within the text. 
you can listen to a passage, then stop the recording, and then our students to imitate what the way it was said. This is something I, I think they already use, or you should encourage them to do it, uh, because this will help them with speaking and pronunciation. Imitation is a great way of um, developing uh, pronunciation and, and, and speaking skills, I, I think. Okay. Now we can also view and listen, which gives us an, a completely different scaffolding to the narrative text. Now you know the drill. We are comparing the different resources and what meanings they carry. So you can ask like, does the audio convey the same meaning as the image? There is a really interesting complementary relationship in creating a multimodal text. It might be a really hard way. It, it might be for more advanced uh, lessons or for lessons when students feel more comfortable with only listening. Um, when you, you don't let students actually read the text, you just ask them to listen and look at the illustration. Okay, so here, what can you do when you are reading, for example, uh, uh, an illustrated story like uh, Midnight Bay? You play the recording and the students only look at the illustration to help focus, help it focus on the imagination and just ask students to know down information they heard but could not see. It's different again because they might have even less information present in the image than they would have in the text. So it's a different kind of game that you can play. Um, so this is how you combine all these different skills together. And to really summarize the whole idea and to go through this, these steps with you again and again. Um, I'm sorry, I, I went too fast. When we are practicing or when we are help, helping students um, prepare for multimodal reading experiences, uh, there are very different resources at work with different meanings. And they work together to create a complex story. Um, when you are doing this, you are actually developing some kind of multimodal awareness or just text awareness of the meaning potential of each mode. And they help us create and get layered meanings out of the text. Focusing explicitly on multimodal reading, we also have student support uh, support skills development through scaffolding across the modes because each mode gives additional support to practicing skills. So when you are listening and viewing, you get some more help. When you are on, when you're reading and viewing, you get a different sort of help and different focus. Um, it's also important because let me go to the slide which talks about how it helps your students in a larger context, a wider context. It develops a critical gaze for making meaning with texts. And, and I showed you examples from the graded readers and the thinking train series, but you could take the same approach and same uh, exercises and, and questions and, and, and choose a poster or a website or a magazine or any kind of social media uh, page and ask students to, to do the same kind of drill, comparing the different meaning making resources, how they complement each other, how the meanings differ and how all these different interesting relationships create new meanings. This is not just a simple multimodal skills. This is a really interesting critical skill that they are developing this way because once they have the knowledge to notice this, and the, the practice, and then they have the language to talk about it, then they can really become critically reflective people who can actually put all these analytical and critical views into language. And this is what we are actually helping here. It's one thing that we help them with pronunciation and vocabulary building and viewing and talking about emotions, but in a, in a larger, uh, sense or in a more interesting sense, we are actually helping them uh, to become critical readers. So, of course, it supports uh, reading comprehension. Uh, implied meanings might be highlighted 
through the intonation if students learn to listen uh, to to people's voices they might understand what implied meaning means or if they learn to to look at an image they might understand what the implied meanings might be highlighted through the illustration so in a way when you are working with multimodal reading you are building knowledge of language multidimensionally as well um, you can focus of course on vocabulary pronunciation and syntax but you are giving it all these traditional focus points even more support from more directions what's more interesting i think is that i'm not saying that reading without the illustrations is not interesting or good because that is really uh imaginative and that really helps your students visual imagery and thinking but when you have illustrations with your text it really brings the text to life explicitly and it can support emotional development um and if the students don't like the illustrations, they can even say that, oh, I imagined it in a different way. So with, with I think that with higher level students or with teenagers or adults even, that's a really good discussion point. Like, do you think that this illustration works with this text? Does it look like, look the way you imagined? Uh, this imagining this, this story in your head? Do the characters look similar or different to the way you imagine them? And, and what I was talking about before, about how it helps students with reading social media and the news and websites and magazines, that's the priority expectation today. Because students are expected to make meaning with interpret and create multimodal texts. But I often see uh, primary school students and even high school students or university students who struggle with putting a really good presentation or photo gallery uh, together because it's not simply just throwing all these resources together. We really need to think about what we want to achieve. Like when I create a slide, why am I using an image? What, what can I show with the image that would be too difficult to explain? This is what Gunther Kress always says, that, uh, writes in his uh, books, is that I need to find the right resource for my communicative objective. Now, to translate it into simple language to your students, you can just say like, is it seem easier to draw what you want to say, write about what you say, or sing what you say? Maybe a sound would be enough to represent some kind of meaning, or maybe you can just use an image or uh, really write down and explain with text what you want to say. And this is multimodal thinking and making choices and students need to be really good at this. This is how they will not end up with uh, presentations or with posters, with super uh, unnecessary uh, resources or too many, much text or too little text, or maybe this is how they can really learn to use images meaningfully. So what they are actually doing, they are really learning how to create multimodal text as well. If they get the chance to talk about this, they learn a meta language to talk about text, which doesn't have to be very technical. It can be really simple. I think that for you, the teachers, what's important is that you, you also become aware of, of all these resources and use them in a way that really supports your lesson in, in that day that you are doing it. So let's say I want to focus on pronunciation today. Today I only want to focus on viewing. It's, it's, it's totally fine. But if you start thinking about the resources together, I think your teaching will be easier. Um, this is the main idea for today. I really hope that um, I, I managed to give you some new ideas or just to confirm some ideas you already had. Um, if you have any questions, uh, I think uh, we can uh, we can talk about it, um, or you can just put questions in the 
in the chat box if you have something really important to ask now. Otherwise, what I recommend is that you go on the harbling.com English website, or you can just simply check this uh, the Harbling Reader's blog, where you will find quite a lot of information about visual literacy, reading strategies, uh, multimodality, and, and skills development as well as well as uh, interviews with illustrators where they really talk about their, their process. So they might be interesting for you to read. It was a pleasure to have you here today. And I hope to see you soon uh, in another webinar session. Thank you very much. Nora, thank you so much for your time today. As you can see in the chat box, absolutely fantastic feedback. People really, really enjoyed the session. Sorry, I took a second to turn my camera on because I just opened up the blog. I thought maybe what we could do is just take a minute or two for those people that are still um, logged in and want to. If I share my screen, I'm just going to give people a chance to see um, what we have on an idea of some of the things that we have on the blog. So for those of you not already familiar with the Helbling Readers blog, um, there are tips, teaching ideas, how to set up your own um, book club, how to develop. There's always a theme or a topic. So at the moment you can see skills development is the um, topic um, and a very in-depth look at how to um, expand and, and um, focus on particular skills. Nora, I don't know if there's something you'd like to add or mention um, comment more about your sound your sound is off for the blog you mean yeah there's anything i think it's interesting to check out the reading strategies series there's a series we had on reading strategies last year and we have one about skills development today and in this series we compare uh or, or reflect on traditional ideas about skills in the language classroom, and we put them in the in context uh, today, thinking about all the digital uh, digital uh, resources we have today. You see, there is the reading strategies like the power of the voice. We had another interesting series called Making Connections. Uh, and we have quite a lot about uh, emotions, but I, I really also love to point out the, all the interviews we have with um, uh, interviews we have with authors and uh, illustrators and interesting people in ELT. So I think if you check the blog, you will find a lot of resources. We also have quite a lot of downloadable uh, worksheets to use with uh, stories and readers. So. Start browsing and I think you will find something really interesting. Thank yeah, you. I just clicked on one of the links. Sorry, it just took a second. It's taking a second to check that it's a secure connection, but you can see, for example, under classroom resources, theme-based lessons, book-based lessons, CLIL projects, games and quizzes. It's a whole wealth of material. So please do check it out if you haven't. And don't forget that you can also subscribe just by filling in your email address. Um, you get a monthly uh, update and you also get um, notifications of when a new post has been um, added to the blog. It's fantastic. So really, all that remains for me to say is thank you so much, Nora. Fantastic session. Please, to everybody that's joined us, um, please take um, the opportunity when you get your email tomorrow with your link for your certificate. There'll also be a link to sign up to the newsletter. So take advantage and sign up. It's completely free. Tons of teaching tips and resources. And thank you all very much for joining us today. Thanks, Nora. Thank you, everybody. See you all again soon. Bye-bye.